record. Okay, so it's week two of semester two's recording. Um, welcome to those um, that, that are joining me. I'm just going to share my screen with you. So if you can just give me a minute, I will do that. Perfect. So there we go. All done. So this is your TFS 702. This is still unit one. And this will be your integrated language teaching uh, uh, lesson, online recording. So we now have semester two, week two. You know my name by now. And yes, we're going to look at um, your SS1 assignment a little bit. I decided to include it um, as I've come to realize that maybe some of you might be a bit confused because I've received a few emails about um, assignment one. So at the end, I will include a few uh, things that I think you need to remember for assignment one. Okay. So remember, we always have these quizzes because we always want to know how you are doing. And how are you feeling at the start of this of semester two? And a lot of you said that you were excited. Uh, I'm sure some of you that were part of us for semester one, uh, I can fully understand how intense this module can be. Uh, this course can be, it requires quite a lot of um, work that needs to be done and a lot of listening to the online recordings to be able to answer your SS1 assignments or all the assignments as such. So yes, please, um, I'm glad that most of you are feeling happy. This would be your cohort. And then we had another assessment there. I think it's got to do with um, how fast you did an area and Carisha was obviously the winner there. And yes, we are happy about that. So TFS 702 assessments, I think we need to start out with this. This is the most important one. So your SS1, which we will be your unit one that we are busy doing now, is going to be an assignment based on contextual grammar assessment. Okay, so this will be week four. You're going to have to submit an assignment. I think your date is the 20th. Off from what I can see, 25th of August 2023, and the and the mark allocation for that is 25%. So for your SS2, that will be then unit two. You're going to write do another assignment, and that's going to be based on process writing presentation that you're going to do. For those of you who were with us during semester one, um, it will be similar to what you did for your. Um, SS3 assignment where you have to present a recording to fellow uh, teachers. So just take cognizance. It would be similar. So that's going to be done in week eight. So, you know, we have two dates, 22nd uh, and the 24th, because a lot of you are doing SP and FET. So we're giving you two dates in between so that you have enough time. So that will be uh, on the 22nd and 24th of September. And that counts 30%. Okay, so please take the percentages into consideration as well. Your S is three, your unit three, and that will also be based on your paper one, two, and paper three examination settings. So that will be week 11, and that will be the 22nd to 24th of October, um, and that comes 35%. So you can see the percentages increases as, the, as you're doing the assignment. It's very important to remember those percentages because you obviously know it, it, it's very difficult to essentially pass the entire module um, if if you do not uh, pass every assignment, okay. Then the last part will be your participation mark. Again, we're gonna I'm gonna emphasize this. Last year, last semester, you had ten uh, uh, online tracking tasks to do or quizzes to do. This semester, you only have five, and these will come towards mark. With one will come towards the mark. With three will come towards the mark, with five, with six, and with nine. And that will count 10%. So just bear that in mind. Okay. And this is the weights. As you can see, formal assessment 100% overall mark. So your participation mark is 10%. Assignment one, 25. Assignment two, um, 
30 and assignment 335, and then that will give you a mark of 100%. Okay? Now, we're still busy with SS1, contextualized grammar teaching practices and how to go about teaching grammar. That's essentially what we're focusing on here. So what we want in your assignment is to select a topic called 2023 local and persuasive which just move my face out of the way, local and persuasive text with visual elements for discussing social circumstances. We also would like you to design an assessment using creative questioning te techniques, addressing cognitive thinking levels, and then find, finally provide a detailed marking guide for the assessment and so forth. So there's quite a lot to do and, um, in the Zoom meeting, I went into a lot more detail in terms of your topical, uh, topical top, your, the article that you require or the text that you require. Remember, I said to you that it must be 2023 text, it must be persuasive text, and it must have a visual element to it. Um, um, I think the assignment, the, the 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 wording of the article should be at least between 400 and 450 words, and then there must be a text attached to the text. So, which means that you can't give me different texts. There must only sorry that you can't give me different visuals. The visual must actually be attached to the text, so the two need to link or correlate with each other. Okay, so then after that, I want you to give me a detailed marking guide and so forth. And then your, your assignment must be based on a social issue. So it can be on anything relating to stuff that's happening in your communities, etc., cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's now Women's Month, so you can get an article or text that's um, based on women's issues. It, it anything that 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 has a social element to it. Okay, so let's go further. Um, so you need to design, and here's just a picture of social issues that you can look at. You can look at welfare. We can look at, in this case, um, four guys, many people standing together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there must be a social element to it. And so your unit one, as I've said, your SS1 assignment is going to be based on that. So we're going to look firstly at language, teaching language structure and use in the first language or first additional language classroom. So what do we mean with that? Identifying the importance of teaching language structure and use in your classroom. And, uh, uh, and then applying these integrated grammar teaching strategies. And I think by now you will understand that within this course or module, we very, uh, uh, we, we're, not, we're not gonna focus on isolated grammar cases. We want grammar to be integrated, hence the naming calling integrated grammar teaching strategies, okay? Uh, so um, are you confused, you know? So this is this is what the, a very lovely quote that I love is that a study of traditional school grammar has no effect on raising the quality of students' writing. And then I mean, some of you might be surprised at that. It, we, we, it, it, it will not ever raise the level, raise the quality of student writing. So this information, please read through Pereira's book, chapter thirteen, page one nine four. Um, it, it is. Pereira speaks about everything that you require for this module, people. It, it is unacceptable to still uh, hear that some of you do not have the Ferreira book. It, you can't do this module without the book, so please make sure you have it. We're also going to look at selecting and or designing effective and appropriate resources for integrated language teaching including grammar games and other techniques. So I think last week I delved a little bit on the present continuous tense and how you can use verbs and adjectives in your classroom by using visuals, etc. So that's that's how uh, one way of looking at it. Then we are also going to look at assessing language structure and use. So grammar teaching is not an isolated rule-based activity. By now, you should know that. It's written in red because I want you to understand, no, we don't want isolated rules. So grammar teaching is based that in context. So there must be a context, a text, an article, an advertisement, 
anything a visual, anything that the students will be able to understand the rules, but they will apply it to a text because this is what they're going to use in real life situations. And they're not going to, they, they, they're never going to have to uh, just know the rules. They're going to need to know the rule, but apply the rules in real life situation. And that is by the, the reading articles, etc. Then we are looking at specific language study items like tenses, word classes are part of text that learners are producing, speaking, writing, or encountering, listening, or reading. So we are saying here that uh, when, when our learners are going to study um, tenses or word classes, this must be done within a text situation, within an article, as I've said before, and they must, and that learners are the producing. So this must be done as learners are producing the, the, the text or the article or visual or how they encounter it. You know, when they're listening or reading to something, they must be able to identify these, these uh, grammar rules, but never in isolation. So structured input for language proficiency, remember this, an out of context grammar instruction with no connection to authentic writing often leads to students disengaging. And that's true. If you're just going to tell them, you know, the rule of something, do you know what is the rule of the simple past tense, and you give them the rule and then they write maybe a sentence, and then they have to write the answer. Yes, there's a place for that, but the only way that they're really going to understand it in a more uh, critical manner, you know, where they will develop help is when it's done out of context grammar instruction with no connection, when it's done within a text. And if it's done without a text, this is what you're going to encounter. You're going to encounter out of context grammar instruction with no connection to authentic writing. And this often leads to student disengagement. Students will not engage in your classroom practices. There's a, um, and then yeah, again, it says research indicates that learners proficiency improves when teachers encourage discussions about grammatical item, items, which learners have read heard, spoken, or written. So yeah, again, there that prior knowledge is, is extremely important in this case. And then and they push learners to process these by means of structured input processing. Remember what I said to you during week one is that normally the learners come with something to the classroom. So what you need to do is to, to remember there was the I and then the plus one. Uh, that 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 I've mentioned. So the I plus one is the plus one is where you push them. The I is what they know already. So this is their prior knowledge. But the plus one is where you push them into learning something new. And how do you do that? How do you push them to learn something new? And we are saying by not using rules, you know, grammar rules specifically. Yes, you teach them the rule, but, but it's not the most the, the most effective way of them understanding it in the long run or understanding it in the workplace or with an examination is it actually when it's integrated into a text or a visual, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you have your, um, the competence, competency of the learner, plus you add one, and then almost like a little bit push the learner to get that one. And then we also want, obviously, learners into the classrooms. That's extremely important, okay? So teaching and learning grammar. Learners need to learn grammar implicitly and explicitly. So I know by now, uh, implicit, sorry, okay, explicitly is where it's more of the rules. You know, you give them a little bit of the rules, but the more, most, the more important area would be implicit teaching. This is where you have your text based teaching, okay? And I'm, I'm going to emphasize that this is one of the questions that you need to answer with your SS1 assignment, okay? It, it's very important. I think that's um, where they're asking you about implicit and explicit grammar um, and that you must so write about that. I would suggest that when you write about that, you go to your Ferreira textbook and you look it up or any other textbook that you have. 
please, when answering this question, it's important that you give an in-text reference and then the full reference at the back, okay? When you're done with your assignment. So learners need to learn grammar implicitly and explicitly, but the language learning journey is more complicated than simple grammar rules. That's true. We keep on saying that students are good at doing grammar exercises. We know that. I mean, if you give them like a sentence, you know, write it in the simple, rewrite the sentence in the simple past tense, it's going to be easier for them to do that. But however, when it comes to applying this grammar in their writing, they fall short. Okay, so if they are giving them the rules, and the, but when it comes to writing, they're going to fall short. Why? Most likely because teachers tend to teach writing and grammar as separate concepts it cannot be taught as separate concepts okay here are some strategies to make writing more of uh, um, making writing more part of the grammar classroom so these are a few things that we're going to look at so i mean these are just examples of um normally what you will get in a grammar classroom we've just given it to you there so you can look at that how to teach grammar five best practices and there where you're going to find it but yeah, we question whether this is going to be effective uh, for um, your students to actually use the grammar knowledge or the grammar rules within essays or within writing transactional pieces, which would be your um, letters, you know, um, uh, their CV, covering letters, etc. So five tips for grammar teaching. So there's five tips that we are going to give you now for grammar teaching. Um, in your classroom, number one, you need to provide models and examples. Okay, so it's important that you do that. You need to include writing every day. So that's the second tip we are giving you. Number three will be you need to design your lesson with the learner in mind. So there, it, your content, you know, what is it going to be about? I mean, students don't necessarily want to know about something that's so unfamiliar to them. You know, if you design your learning mind, I would think you would think about something like TikTok, for example, as, as something that the learners would enjoy knowing more about. You know, you do, you need to design your rubric with grammar in mind and then use pictures to elicit writing. And I think we, if we did that a little bit in week one, where we showed you how to teach uh, prepositions and adjectives, and, and um, I think it's verbs and so forth, how to use pictures to, to um, in your writing. Now, you need to, on tip one, so the first step here, we said uh, provide models and examples. So yeah, provide examples and models. So when introducing a grammar concept, show students some model paragraph or text which illustrate this concept nicely. Okay, so this is one now one you could do. For example, this one on producer, little to cheer on Women's Day while injustice against women continues. Okay, for example, when teaching direct and indirect reported speech, you can take a news article and highlight the examples of direct or indirect speech for letters to expose them to the new form. Let's look at this one, for example. Okay, it said there was little to celebrate on Women's Day while injustice against women uh, continued. So there, it, and then the second one, is where you have something that's written in inverted commas again. We need to come to that point as women in this country and say enough is enough and say how do we solve this problem ourselves. This is in the last said. So this is how you can teach reported speech. And in, because obviously the first one there is, is the first example would be indirect speech. Okay, because it said, it said, for example, okay, in when it comes to indirect speech, you don't have inverted commas. But when you look at the second sentence there, you have inverted commas. So that you immediately can tell your students, now what's the difference between sentence one and sentence three, for example? Okay, so there you'll say, okay, sentence one, it said, maybe you can look at the tense, you know, it's written in the past tense, for example. Uh, the, the second one has inverted commas. So what makes it now direct speech, okay? 
and, and look at the wording with even there. So this is how we mean with learners are learning something with a text and they can see the example in front of them. So let, let learners study bolded or highlighted sentences and as right as uh, and why these sentences are written the way they are written. This is this is really how you go about it. So the students are, it's still that inductive learning where they are discovering things for themselves, okay? Now provide, it's still busy with tip one, provide examples, models for indirect and direct speech. You could show two copies of the same article, one with direct speech and one with indirect speech. And then allow students to compare and contrast to figure out grammatical rules underlying this concept. Okay, so alternatively, you can show students a text after you have introduced the grammar concept to the students. So you do introduce the grammar concept. So you teach them, this is what direct speech is. This is what direct speech is. So you give them the rule. Don't get me wrong. We're not going to say you must ignore it, but then they apply it practically to a text. Okay. So ask them to find all the examples of the rules we have just taught and that they can do Ramaphosa. There's Ramaphosa. There's um, colon. The struggle of essay woman is not done yet. So obviously you can ask them uh, to, to um, look at this text okay, and see how, whether the rules have been applied. And here at the bottom it says, President Sura Ramaphosa said that the struggle of South African women was not yet done. Again, you will see immediately that this is not direct speech because why is it not direct speech? There's no inverted comma, okay? Uh, they, uh, this is obviously in, this is obviously indirect speech where he says that the president said that. So you don't need inverted commas. And that's how you go about it. The same thing with this example, the women of South Africa today have attained a number of rights. They've attained an, a number of opportunities. You can see that they are what? Inverted commas. So automatically this make it direct speech, okay? So now tip one, we can continue. While teaching prison continues, you can give learners a TED talk. So this is continued uh, tense again, okay? Learners campaign contrast simple, uh, uh, contrast present simple and continuous tenses and suggest how these can be changed to past simple and continuous tenses. So this is your TED talk that you can give them. So yeah and so forth, okay? So how do you go about this? You know, there you see ease falling. This is an example. Uh, um, the market barely existed seven years ago, yet today creators are uploading 702 million short videos every day. As our attention is falling, so automatically <laughs> is falling. What is that? That is your simple continuous tense. So then there they can see it in the context, are uploading. Again, the simple continuous tense have been used, you know, are facing and so forth. Uh, is, is using, is making, and then you can ask them to rewrite it maybe in the simple past tense, et cetera. So a simple, uh, sorry, the past continuous tense. Okay. Whether you use text before instruction or after, seeing grammar concepts in the appropriate and realistic concept is, a criti is critical for your learners. If learners can't understand patterns and situations in which grammar is useful and applicable, they will not be able to move beyond basic drills. So they must see the application of these rules within context. Otherwise, it will be a waste of time. When they leave your class, you're just going to give them the rule, but you don't give them context or visuals or uh, tips like the tips that we are giving you here today. They will be, it will be very difficult for them to apply this for the essay writing, for example, when they write the essay or transactional piece or when they just have to write uh, uh, even something within one of the other subjects. Okay. So let's go on. Seeing grammar and others writing and text will empower learners to become more confident in using the structures in their own writing. Okay. So let's, there we go. So tip number two, a writing per day keeps the errors away. So what do we mean with that? 
After introducing and practicing a grammar concept, give learners a short informal writing task to illustrate the grammar concept. So this is step number two, where you're telling them to write on a daily basis. Immediate writing with a prompt aimed at, so the first one would be give learners short informal writing tasks to illustrate the grammar concept. So that's one way you can do it. And then immediate writing with a prompt aimed at eliciting the grammar structure will get learners into producing the grammar more naturally than sentence drill. I think I, uh, I think during week one, we did an example of this where we use the word since. Um, uh, I think it's the house that the person moved in. You can just go to week one. There's an example where the lecturer actually, the teacher uses prompting words and then the students start writing. So that's quite interesting there. Think of your present, uh, uh, a present you received that you didn't like. How did you react? And did the person suspect you didn't like it? You know, so how did you react? You know, um, then so you will say, how did you react? I reacted with excitement at present you received that you did. I reacted um, with excitement, even though I did not etc etc so these are the ways you just prompt describe the most insecure person you know and what makes them so insecure so you are prompting the students to do the to 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 uh answer this particular question and then the last one think of the most miserable person you have ever met devise a plan to cheer them up even if it's just for a short time okay so there you can also then get your search your learners to write every day a writing per day keeps the errors away. Yeah, something about the doctor, the apple a day keeps the doctor away, similarly to that. By writing frequently, you are building learners' association between grammar and writing. And you're also emphasizing writing more than grammar in the classroom enforces the idea that language learning is not simply memorizing rules. Okay, so by th that's one of the... The only rule is no rules, okay? So design, the third tip. So we've had two th tips already. Um, so this is tip number three. Design your lessons with your learner in mind. Remember I said to correct or not to correct, that's the question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how teachers feel most of the time when they have to do this marking. So each time you evaluate learners' writing, jot down a few sentences from each learner's paper that contains errors. So uh, a good warm-up activity is to make a worksheet based on learners' errors, learners' error, learner, sorry, based on learner errors, and go over them as a class, because now the students will see their work in action. Um, remind learners that everyone makes mistakes, even the teacher, and that each learner has one error represented in the worksheet. After learners have practiced correcting these errors, they can return to their writing to revise and improve. So that's one way of going about it. Now design, sorry, tip four, design your rubric with a uh, grammar in mind. So this is be your rubric. Um, um, this is normally when, that you've marked something and this the ruby guides you with your marking. So rather than taking language risks, learners stay on the safe side and use simplistic sentences, okay? So push learners to practice using the more complex structures that you've been teaching in class. And then design your rubric to include specific points addressing which kind of grammatical structures you would like to see. For example, complex sentences. You don't just want the simple sentences. You know, we, we want more complex sentences so that because that's how you know that your learner has now learned new language structures and that they can apply those language structures. So for example, grammar and sentences. So this is a rubric. The sentences are clear and easy to understand. Each sentence contains one idea. They are low grammatical mistakes. Okay. So this could be for your essay assignment, but there's an area of grammar that's in there, there's a section on on um, grammar and sentence structure in your rubric, for example. Okay. 
Another example will be grammar again here. Yeah. Grammar are, they are limited areas in capitalization, punctuation, or spelling. That's how you go about it. Again, here's another example of, of a rubric where, where grammar is included. Short sentences all start with the same word. Most sentences are incomplete or run on. And you can see the, the face is that we are not happy with that. You know, this is not what you said. Look, if you look at strong number four, the four marks there, it says many sentences begin differently and vary in length. So that is what we want. So we're still busy with tip four, design your rubric with grammar in mind. So this is another way. One approach is to tell learners to use a minimum number of grammatical structure for each writing. So for example, you might assign learners a narrative essay in which they must use at least five examples of the of past perfect tense, okay? Alternatively, you can also implement a point system which reward learners for using target language. For sentence a variety, assign students to write a paragraph, and this is how you go about it. One point for every simple sentence they use, five points for every compound sentence they use, 10 points for every compound and complex sentence they use. I think that's very interesting because they are being rewarded with more marks by using more complex sentence structures, and that's important. Remind students that often essays are awarded higher points for using more complicated structures, so they should begin this practice now. Okay, so daddy, do you like my picture? I love this. And obviously dad is now being a bit brutal by saying to his daughter, do you like my picture? And he says, honey, if you like me to be objective, so being extremely truthful, I'll have to create a rubric because obviously he was going to have to create, if he has to create a rubric, he's going to have to look at how she stepped uh, how she stood in the picture, you know, how was the angles taken the right way, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, tip number five. So use pictures to elicit writing. Okay, so again, we're always emphasizing this. Some grammatical structures are difficult to bring out in expository writing. Okay, so for example, the pre present continuous is used quite infrequently compared with present simple. So, you know, present continuous would be e sitting um, and present simple will be ease, um, will be, will be sitting. No, she is, no, she's eaten her food. Okay, so that's the difference there. To elicit a wide range of tenses, you can use pictures in your writing classroom. And how do we do that? Depending on the particular grammar structure you are teaching, picture gives writers the freedom to practice virtually any tense. And it's so true. I think um, uh, with week one's lecture, I, I did a few uh, examples with the man wearing a hat and we were and, and we said that's one way of teaching prepositions, you know, the hat on top of his head. You know, is he so? So uh, you know, the earrings is it on your ears, etc. So if they see a picture, sometimes you can, you can virtually practice any any tense. Okay, so police investigate after boy sixteen loses control of car and slams into cyclists. So what has happened? So yeah, they see a picture. So now they have to explain what has happened. Okay. So the students will say that uh, the what has happened is that a class a a class had a car has um had slammed into a cyclist. It had this it and that is how you teach the 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 present continuous tense. Okay, sorry. <laughs> This recording is quite long, so I think I'm getting a bit tired. Again, yeah. What will you tell your friend, mother? Primary schoolers raise enough money to build 73 ping, uh, ping, uh, penguin nests. Again, there it is um, a picture, and you can just, you're going to tell your, 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 your parents enough to raise. What will you tell your friend or your mother? And that's how you can teach a tense. And then finally, here we have another one with Cyril 
And then what were they doing? Again, that's how you can elicit information. Here's a few, another few examples that you can use in order to teach grammar differently. The tenses, for example, what was happening, da 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 da, and so forth. Tip number five is to use pictures to elicit writing. So if you want to compare, for example, for example, a celebrity comparisons, you want to teach comparisons and contrasting. This is how you're going to do it. This is a great activity for learners who are into celebrities. And I think a lot of young people are into celebrities nowadays. So here we have something about Steve Jobs. I mean, if you know him, he's the founder of Apple. And then this is all about Steve Jobs. And then you can look at my job is not to be easy on people. My job is to make them better. I mean, there you can even see the quotation marks. So there will be a good way of teaching direct and indirect speech. Okay. And then magazines like people will work best. More celebrity pics, the better. Use celebrity photos to spark comparison. So for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger is taller than Tom Cruise. He's also bigger, but Tom is a better actor. So here you are looking at comparing something and contrasting. Maybe I have a picture of Tom Cruise and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I suppose with younger people, you can look at South African celebrities that they might identify with immediately. It's just an option that you can use. Um, and then you can also say who's the most talented actor of them all or songwriter, then they can compare, you know, and then see what your students have to say. So here's about Netflix, and this is the latest that they can use to do comparison and contrasting. Another few pictures there. Um, I haven't even had time to look at any of this. They can also look at the top 10 best phones. Why are they the top 10 best phones? So again, tip five, we're continuing using pictures to elicit writing. Yes, there's again, for present continuous, you can ask learners to describe what is happening, okay? So what will you say there? If the woman is crying or pulling her face, it's okay. For present perfect, you can show a picture of a person and ask students to write down life experiences of this person. Or you can look at for advanced learners, you can ask them to predict that person's future using future simple and future, future perfect continuous. So um, well, and you will use words like well and shall when it's going to be the uh, past perfect for example, it will be used like um, wa uh, uh, was and were, sorry. I'm getting confused. And you can use these pictures as well. So again, uh, what's happening here, this is a wonderful way to practice tenses like the present continuous and not have to resort to the same illustrations your learners have already seen countless times before. You choose a picture, photo from a magazine, Make sure it's a scene where there's a lot going on, like an airport, restaurant, a family doing some outdoor stuff, and simply show them the picture and ask, what's happening in this picture? What are the people doing? And what are they thinking? Okay, so this is the picture that we're looking at. And then you can ask them those few questions. Okay, so continuing with tip number five, using pictures, you need to also focusing on headlines. Headlines may spark great speaking activities as well as give a glimpse into newspaper and magazine headline languages. So before asking learners to open the magazine, list some of the headlines featured in the magazine and ask them to say what they think each article is about. Then they can write a list of topics that correspond to those headlines and ask learners to match the right topic to the right headline, okay? So there we go, there we go, lots of headlines that you can use. Again, using pictures, you can find the differences. Uh, show learners two magazine pictures that present a similar situation. It could be people in the office, people playing sport, or people showing different emotions. And then you can ask them, show learners each set and ask them to tell the class what these pictures have in common and how they differ. There we go. And then that's what you can do. OK, 
okay? Must, learners must do. One of the biggest disservice we can do to our learners is to fail, is fail to give them practical situations to apply their grammatical knowledge. And I mean, we've done practical information. Without successful strategies to use grammar, these structures are quite useless on their own. And hopefully, these steps will encourage you to integrate grammar into various reading, speaking, listening, and writing context. Okay? And so, yeah, you have to do something. You can't just sit. So your task will be chapter 13, Ferreira again. And then um, this reflection on use of descriptive or prescriptive grammar, this will be in your Ferreira textbook. You need to read the section because this is part of your uh, SS1 assignment. Okay. There's, again, strategies to remember words and so forth. Um, so there's an example in Ferreira on the washer's woman's prayer. And there's a picture, look at her hands, raw, knobbly and calloused. Look at her face, like a beam seed soaked in brine. That's a poem and so forth. So um, yes, there, there we are at. And so these are the examples that we're going to use. What's next to learn students need to do something. Okay. I just decided also to just add, I did this with a Zoom meeting, but I thought I'll just add these a few pointers for your SS1 assignment. I, I marked these last year. So it was just a few pointers that I want to uh, bring up since I'm now doing this recording. So please bear with me. Please know that your SS1, number one, I said there, it must be a 2023 article. We've mentioned it. Your assignment must look like a first additional language grammar paper. So you need to, when, and that's a lot of students didn't do that last year. They, it need, it, your paper needs to look like an, a grammar paper. So you must please write the name of a school, make up the name of a school, how long the paper will be, the time, the mark allocation. You also need to uh, give me the name of the, the examiner. So you can be the examiner and you can make up the name of the moderator. You can use my name as the moderator, but it needs to be structured in such a way that it looks like a formal paper. You also need to write instructions for this paper. You know, and, and the, the thing that I just want you to remember is that the number of words of the article or text for SP, for first additional language, SP is, would be about 400 to 450 words. So I want you to use a text uh, an article that has about 400 and to 450 words. I would also appreciate it if you write the number of words uh, that of the article so that it makes it easier for the marker to mark your script, okay? And then also additionally, your, your, your article or text must have a visual attached to it, okay? I must have a visual. Uh, 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 no, uh, it should actually have been must have a visual attached to it, to a, a visual attached to the article or the text. And please don't give me five different visuals and then you want to ask me questions about that. It must be one visual. If there may be within a text that you found, you might find two visuals. I can accept that, but I know that's part of the text, okay? The article and the visual must be clear. It's so important for you to remember that because it was sometimes difficult for the marker to see the article properly because it was not clear. Um, paragraphs must be numbered. So I want to see, you're going to take an article, you're going to add paragraph numbers. Okay. And the reason why you're adding paragraph numbers is because if you're going to ask a student a question, because this is a grammar question paper, remember, you can't say to the student, look at the entire text. No, you have to say to them, refer to paragraph one. Hence the reason the students need to see paragraph one, paragraph two. Some questions you will say, go to para refer to paragraph five, for, for example. So I want to see the surname of the author and the date. Sorry, you must, sorry, before we, so indicate the number of words of the article. Then, um, Okay, let me go back. Paragraph must be numbered. That I've indicated to you now. Please indicate the number of words of the article. Please, you can use that. It will make it easier for the marker. Provide an in-text reference for your article. And that is, people, you have found the article. You must re provide a, a reference. And only your in-text reference will be your surname of the author and the date. 
that um, that or the I think it's the the year of that you've seen the article, you have to go through referencing to see how to reference that properly. And in your referencing section, provide a full reference of all in-text references. It's important, people, because referencing has a mark allocation for it. And if you don't do it, you will almost lose 10 marks. Okay. When asking a question, please refer to the paragraph or a word. Remember, this links up with where I said to you, your paragraph needs to be numbered. Okay. So the four uh, integrated grammar questions that you will, will have to ask questions on will be on your visual literacy. Remember, your text must have a visual attached to it. So I'm looking at three to four questions for uh, the visual literacy question. So, I mean, I just added the angle of shot or colors. That's part of visual literacy. So don't, there's only four integrated grammar questions. Visual literacy, four questions. Then there must be four questions on register and style. Okay. Then there must be four questions on language structures and conventions. And then there must be four questions on social discourse. So, um, so this is your paper. This is your grammar paper. Is that clear? Okay. I just forgot to explain to you that there must also be a memorandum attached to it uh, of, of, of the question paper. Please do not just give a paper. There's strict instructions in your memorandum and what it must look like. The last part is, is, is very important as well. Uh, another thing that you must do in your assignment is that you must reflect on the grammar lesson activity and assessment. Okay. You must comment on the need to teach grammar implicitly or explicitly. And I suppose you will have to teach it explicitly a little bit and implicitly. Please go and look at Ferreira. Look what Ferreira says about implicit reading and explicit reading. If you're going to use the words of Ferreira or any other reference, please do an in-text referencing for that and ensure that your reference is fully referenced uh, um, at the, uh, with your final referencing list. And then also, with this question, this part, so you're going to speak about implicit or explicit grammar, the comment, the need for it. And you're also going to provide a grammar example to guide language teachers in the SP classroom. So you must give us an example of how you are going to teach grammar, for example, implicitly by using a, a, a grammar example, a, 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 an activity that you would use in the classroom. Okay, so I just took one or two visual literacy questions here. So visual literacy. So this is what it will look like. Even if you can see, it looks like a proper question because I've got numbering, you know, visual literacy. Under visual literacy, try type out question one, have visual literacy, and then you type your questions 1.1, 1 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4. That will be your four questions under visual literacy, for example. I just use one thing here where it says study the photo, use in the article, and comment on the colors captured by the photographer. What emotion does it make the reader feel? There must be a mark location. You understand? But this question must be answered in your memorandum. So it's important that you know that. Just another question on social discourse. Remember, there are four categories. So you need to all ask questions on all four. This one will be, apologies, read the caption under the photo and explain whether the word used is positive or, or negative. Sorry about that. Provide two examples. So again, there the numbering. This will be under social discourse, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.4. This is just to show you the number of words for your article. And for SPs, for example, for grade nine, first additional language, it will be 400 to 450 words. Now, this is your rubric. This is what the marker is going to use to mark your script, your, your, um, your question paper. They will look at your text selection. The text selection alone, if it's topical, it is local, it's persuasive, that will already give you a mark out of 10. Okay, so follow this uh, this uh, very in, uh, this rubric. Uh, the rubric is there as a guide. Also, if you give me write the paragraph numbers, you know what I mean. If you give me a visual, if you do it correct, you can get quite an, a, a high. A mark for that integrated contextual grammar assessment practices, whether you've applied these practices by 
uh, the questions that you've asked. Okay, so that's for 20 marks. Question design. So have you looked at your four areas? And your four areas would be your, um, oh, goodness me, visual literacy. The second one would be register and style. The third one would be in the, uh, your language Con language practices and conventions and your fourth one will be social discourse so did, did you incorporate that into your this question paper then did you i mean the marking guide is 20 marks alone so it, it's very important in order for you to actually pass the test okay so there it's 10 marks for the reflection about explicit and implicit language teaching grammar teaching practices and then also the example that will give you a mark of 10 10 marks that's a lot of marks so explain that as i've said if you use ferrera uh, uh, or any other refer uh, reference please make sure there's an in-text reference as well as a full reference we're also going to give you a mark for language use of your question paper so don't make unnecessarily unnecessary spelling errors and word structure errors make sure that you have actually looked at your language usage. And look here, people, a lot of you referencing 10 marks. Again, I'm emphasizing the fact that you need to do, you need to have in-text references and you need to have a full reference list at the, uh, when you're done with your assignment. And the, the obviously the in-text reference and the reference list must uh, correspond. Okay, so that's me in a nutshell. Thank you uh, for this. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.